this. And that's great. We need that. On a growing church, we need more people to get involved and do something. But if you're not careful, you'll talk yourself out of that. If you're not prayed up, if you're not having a close relationship with God, you'll say, well, can I really do that? Do I really have time to do that? You know, well, you know, that kind of interferes with baseball and basketball and kind of interferes with, you know, my wife time and kind of interferes with my kid time and, and my job. And, and we'll just talk ourselves right out of it. We get so excited. And the Bible talks about that. The word's implanted, but it doesn't have any roots because the devil comes and takes it away from you. He talks you out of it. And it's usually us that talks ourselves out of it. We start making excuses instead of just being quiet and being all in. If you're sold out, if you're in love with God, then there's nothing that you won't do for him. There's nothing that you won't do for him. And Josh said it, said it here a couple weeks ago. He said, you know, he's going to ask you to do things that you don't think you can do. He is. He's going to ask you to do things because he wants us to step out and he wants us to grow. Do we not ask our children to step up and do things that they don't think they can do? And then after they get them done, they, they feel good about it? They feel better? You know, sure, it takes some practice. It takes some doing it. But they come out better for it on the other side. And so that's the way you and I are, are going to do it. That's the way it has to be done. You're not going to be great at it the first time you do it. Rob, you remember the first message that you ever preached? <laughs> I can sure remember mine, and I think all I did was just read Scripture. I think half the people was asleep the time I got done. We need to take and, and, and let God mold us and shape us. He's the potter, and we're the clay. But you need to be moldable clay. Don't be that hard clay that he can't do anything with. Okay? Don't be that clay that gets thrown out over there to the pile it has to go back through the fire again to be reused. How many of you don't want to go back through the fire again and again and again? Yeah, I don't either. And I made up my mind in that fire. I'm done with that. I'm done with that. I'm done with that worldly living. It wasn't just drugs. It wasn't just uh, the addiction to money. It was, it was, I'm done with that. I'm done with satisfying my flesh. I'm done with living a life away from God. If I just stay in his presence, I know I'm going to be better for it. Am I going to be perfect? No, I'm not. I'm a work in progress, just like everybody else is. But I'm better today than I was yesterday. That's the key. Are you better today than you were yesterday? Are you still stuck in that rut? Are you still stuck in that woe is me? Are you still stuck in that satisfying my flesh, my needs? Because I, I can promise you this, if you'll meet somebody else's need, God will meet your need. That's biblical. That's a promise. That's his word. If you'll meet someone else's need, he'll meet your need. Now, he may not meet it the way you want him to, but it'll be better than what we can even think or ask. Because that's what his word says. That's his truth. The Bible says in James 1 and 22, be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. So many times we want to come to church and we just want to hear and we get excited about that and we never do it. We never put any action to it. We never step out and, and, and apply that to our life. And it's not ever going to change your life if you don't put action to it. God's word is here and it's truth, but if you don't pick it up and apply it to your life and, and, and live it, how is it ever going to change anything? Doers, doers of the word and not merely hearers. You know, uh, and I always go back to my kids because I can tell them what to do and if they just listen and don't do it, I'm going to get mad. And I can imagine how my father feels if he just kept telling me and telling me and telling me, yeah, God, I get it. Yeah, God, I get it. I'll take out the trash. I will. Next week, next month, and it just keeps building up, keeps building up. And finally, it starts stinking, like some of our lives do. It starts getting messy. When he said, I told you what you needed to do. I told you how to fix that in your life. Well, God, can't you do it another way? <laughs> you know, I don't really like that way. Can't you do it another way? 
And he said, you've tried it them other ways. Did it work? How's that working for you? How's that working for you? I've had many people tell me, come to me and tell me, hey, you know, I want to come to recovery class, but I don't see God the way you do. I don't really see Jesus Christ as the way you do. I have my own God and I have my own beliefs. And I ask them, how's that working for you? That's all I ask is, how's that working for you? Is that working out for you? Because it never worked out, worked out for me. And I just wonder how it's worked. Well, you know, it's not too good. Well, then you need to change something. If it's not working, you need to do something different. You know, we, we keep doing the same old thing, and we expect it to, to come up with a different result. And that's insanity. Doing the same thing again and again, expecting it to be different. It's not going to be different. You keep believing in that same God and that same thing, and it's not working for you, then maybe you need to change what you're believing in. Yes, sir. Because God will never fail you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. In the last 14 years, I've learned that, that that is a truth that has come true more times in my life than I can ever imagine. But the whole 31 years before that, it was just up and down, up and down, here and there. It was just in and out. And God came in and he changed that. He said, I'm the rock. All you got to do is just give me everything. And then when you get up tomorrow, give me everything. Make that decision again. Because you can't live on yesterday's blessings. You can't live on yesterday's prayers. You can't live on yesterday's manna. Okay? He shows us in the Word. Just take enough for today. And then tomorrow, let's do this again. Let's continue to do this. It's a relationship. It's a lifestyle. Now, I want, I want to show you something in the Word of God. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, I want you to go to Joshua in chapter 7. This is so good. I'm so excited about this word that God showed me. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, it says, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regards to the things under the ban. For Asian, I want you to get that. It started out saying, The sons of Israel, the children of Israel. And then it says, Because of one man. Now, if you haven't read this story, I, I encourage you to read chapter 7. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it and jump through here real quick. But the gist of it is, God said, hey, we're going we're to go into this city, and you're going to destroy everything and everybody. And you're going to take all the gold and all the silver, and you're going to dedicate it to me. Because he deserves it. Okay? Because it should be given to him. And that's what he says. And yet, this one man... He goes in and he says, he sees that pretty gold bar, that little trinket, that little bit of silver, and he says, they'll never miss that. And he takes it and he takes it into his tent and he takes it for himself. But God didn't just say Asian sinned, okay? He said the sons of Israel sinned. Now, if you look at, uh, if you look at verse 11, it says right there, Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant. Israel sinned. Because of one man, because of what one man did, the whole nation, there was, a, there was a curse brought against the whole nation. So they went up to battle against the next people they were going to battle in Ai. And in verse 5 it says, 36 of their men were struck down and killed. Because of this one man's greed, because of this one man's sin, it affected 36 other men. But how, how many of you know those men had families too? They had children too. They had wives too. And it affected all of them. And yet because he decided to take a little bit for himself, the Bible says that he brought that upon the nation of Israel. You feel that in America right now? You feel that going on because people are, are taking the prayer out of schools and taking the commandments out of the courts and taking all that stuff... It's bringing a curse upon Israel. I mean, upon America. And then we've got the weather like it is. We've got people praying for rain. That, that are, We're needing rain. There's so many things that this nation is needing. 
And I, and I have to believe it's because of the sins of the people. It's the, because of the, the things that they're doing, the wickedness, the states that are passing laws saying same-sex marriage and, and all that stuff, the abortions and, you know, the, the stuff that, you know, God just has to look at and say, you know what, what's going on? This is supposed to be a Christian nation. Where's my people? Where's my people standing up and saying this is wrong? I want to show you what they did to the man that did something wrong. If you look in, uh, if you look in verse 24, let's go to verse 24. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Asian, the son of Zeherah, the silver, the mantle, and the, the bar of gold, and they took his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Asher. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire. He brought this sin upon the nation. And yet he brought it upon these 36 other families that were killed because of his sin. And now he's brought it upon his sons and his daughters, his household. And they all had to pay the price for his sin. You see, I, I can relate to that because I know the sin that I, I caused and the thing that caused me to go to prison I brought it upon my children. Okay, it didn't just affect me. It affected my mom. It affected my dad. It affected my son. But I wasn't thinking about that when I was out there running the roads, doing whatever made me happy. I didn't think about that. And so many times we don't. It's like this young man that you seen on the news the other day that, that punched the soccer coach and he died. I'm sure he wasn't thinking about it. He just ruined the rest of his life. 16, 17 years old, got mad, hit somebody, and he died. We've got to understand that there's a consequence for our actions. But we, the, 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 the thing that really is going to stop you from doing that is to realize that it affects so many other people besides you. So many other people are affected besides you. And they handled it back in that day. They handled it, you know. I could imagine getting stoned, but, you know, then to go ahead and light them on fire too. You know, that's, a, that's a pretty bad way to handle your business. But God said, now I'll take the curse away because, because they handled their business. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and kill everybody that's sinning and all that stuff, okay? But what I am telling you is that it's affecting us all, okay? What you're doing is affecting other people and, and what people that don't know Christ is affecting us as a nation. God's the only one that can bring rain. And I don't know if you've read about when they have droughts and when they had stuff back in the day, but they ate their babies. They ate dung. And I won't explain to you what that is. Ask your neighbor what that is, but it's bad. Okay? Because there was no rain, there was nothing to grow. When God gets mad, we better look out. We're a blessed nation. We're a blessed people. But we can't sit by anymore and let people just do whatever they want to do. We've got to stand up and say, you know what? That's not right. That's not right. And they're going to mock you and they're going to laugh at you and they're going to talk down about you. And if you make a touchdown and, and you kneel down and, and you point up to God, they're going to tell you to do that on your own time. Hey, take care of that business, you know, not in front of everybody else. But you come out and say, hey, I'm gay, they pat you on the back and they say, that, you know, good job, well done. That's not right. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And only you and I can change that. And you say, well, what can I do? Well, you can do something. But as a body of Christ, now you've got 150, 200 people Fixing to be doubled, maybe 500 people is what we're praying for. Bigger church, more bodies, more people that can pray, more people that can stand up and say, that's not right. That's not right. 
and we're not going to stand for it. You see, as the body of Christ grows, as we get stronger as a body, we can do more. But you've got to do your part. It never says in here that your part is to warm a pew. It never says that. I don't read that anywhere in here that you're just supposed to come to church and do nothing. And I don't know who that's for, okay? But if the shoe fits, we've got to step up our game, guys. We've got to do more to bring glory to the God that sent His Son to die for us. We've got to say, you know what, God? You, you stepped up for me, and you weren't ashamed of me. And I'm going to step up for you. And I'm going to bring you glory in, in whatever I can do. Whatever I can do. If it's like Sister Laura, she does so much for the church. But when I came in today, she was out there watering the plants. Making sure the church looked beautiful. Mitch got here early, made coffee. You know, there's so many things that we think just gets done. That it just gets taken care of. But it gets taken care of because somebody says, I'm going to show up early to do that. I'm going to meet that need. I'm going to make sure that there's somebody there to do that. In our Sunday school on Sunday mornings, our room is packed. And that's great. That's wonderful. But if I wanted to split it up into two Sunday schools, we couldn't because we don't have anybody to teach the other one. We need somebody to step up and say, you know what? I can do that. Let God use me. All across the board. Pastor read it off over there the other night, the things that we need help with. I mean, just a list of things. And it's only going to get more. The bigger you get, the more the need is. Pastor can't do it by himself. He can't. He'll get burned out and he'll be gone. I'm just telling you. you got an amazing man of God here to shepherd the church. But he's still a man. He still only can take so much. And I talk to him every week and I hear the, pe- the things that people say to him and the way they treat him. And it just makes me want to throw rocks at him. It does. I just can't believe some of the things that they, that they would do. You know, church people. And 99% of the time it's people that are not doing anything in the church. We need to step up and get busy about our business, about our ministry, about what God's called us to do. And you won't have time to be picking on all that other stuff. You have a ministry in the church and you have a mission in the world. Find out what they are. Find out what they are. Quit occupying space and find out why you're here, what you're supposed to be doing, and let God be glorified in everything that you do. And you'll never feel so full of joy and peace and God in your life. Now, things are still going to happen in your life. This is a sin-cursed world, and you're living in a sin-cursed nation. But you're the only one that can change that. You and I are the only ones that can change that in our world, in our family, in our, in our city, in our county, in our state. We're the only ones that can change that. If we sit back and do nothing... We've seen what Israel went through, how bad it got for them. And I don't want to be taken captive. I don't want my kids or my grandkids to be taken captive and live in a communist country and live in a place where they're not free anymore. This, this, this thing with chemical warfare, we've got to step, step up and say, you know, do what's right. Do what's right. We all have a vote as a body, as a nation, we all have a vote and we can step up and say, you know what, we're not going to stand for that. Or we can sit back and do nothing and say, let them take care of it. But you're going to have to make that choice, what you're going to do. Decide today who I'm going to serve. Let's pray. Father God, I just, I give you glory for who you are and what you're doing, Father God for your word, for your truth. I just ask that you show us. Show us what it is that we're supposed to be doing, Father God, as individuals, as a body of Christ, 
as a nation. Help us to to step out and be bold. Help us to, to see the sin in our life, Father God, that is affecting other people. Even the little sins, Father God, the, the weights that are affecting those around us that we need to cast off and we need to say they may not be sin, but if they're not glorifying you, Father God, I don't want anything to do with them. I ask that you touch each person that's here tonight, Father God, and give them direction, clear direction, Father. We need to hear clearly from you because without you, we're nothing, Father. I give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks, guys.